got a great show ahead for you, and you're welcome to it. It's the Scouser and the Three Scots. Well, what a way to put it. So today we've got, how can I put this in a strange way? You're going to need subtitles from a major distance here, guys. You've got a Scouser and Three <laughs> Scots. So first of all, let me introduce you to the guys. Um, Jay, Bobby from Reaction Management, how the hell are you doing? Doing well, well mate. doing well, mate. So, what's the what have you been up to in the in the last twelve months of mayhem, murder, and being behind bars and in the, in your home lockdown and feeling isolated, no music, no venues, no nothing? What, what have you been doing? Uh, well, I mean, I'll kick things off here. Reaction. Funnily enough, had a had a blinding year. I know that sounds weird, but as soon as kind of the shit hit the fan, we went right. Um, hit up all the bands and went, right, we need content. Um, uh, anything you've maybe had lying about that you weren't going to release, let's look at it. Let's do something that way. Um, let's get content out there. Let's just spend the next month, uh, not the next month, well, we thought it was the next couple of months, <laughs> <laughs> um, putting out some music, and, and most bands did that, and every band surpassed anything they had ever done in the past, which I think is probably because there was more people at home, like you said, more people just looking for content, you know. But, but before you know, we go into good. that, before we go into that, Jay, sorry, I have to cut you off, mate. We've got <laughs> 10 questions and we've got to follow the usual routine and find out a little bit about you, about your history. Ah, so, okay. So, so I don't know how you want to do this. One of you will have to start first. So, can you give us a bit of background about yourselves? How did you get into music? What did well, you I'll, 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 I'll go first if you want. I, um, Believe it or not, I started playing instruments when I was really young. Um, so I was I was pretty handy on the old violin, to be fair. I started about five years old and uh, got up to about grade eight on the violin. Um, lived, I was living down in Birmingham at the time and I got I managed to get uh, playing the ICC with Nigel Kennedy and playing uh, some decent youth orchestras and stuff. But when I got to high school, um, I was obviously too embarrassed to even take a violin to school. And um, I heard people playing guitars and things like that. And and then I heard these different kind of noises coming out of the amplifiers and stuff. And I thought, oh, I like that. Um, and that kind of took me down the path of meeting friends at school. And then they introduced me to uh, Metallica and then that things got started from there. <laughs> So obviously we either went uphill or downhill, I don't know, but yeah, that's how it, I kind of got started anyway. That's pretty cool. What about you, Jay? Um, I uh, I was lucky enough, like well, a lot of people sort of grew up in a household where like, my parents were right into their music as well. So I sort of grew up, you know, with um, like sort of classic rock bands. I, I obviously, I'm a bit older than Bobby. Classic rock bands and a lot of Motown as well, funnily enough, you know, in the house. Um, and uh, as I got older, you know, into my teens, I started to get into like a lot of sort of gothy bands, actually, like The Cure and Sisters of Mercy. And it wasn't until I was sort of in high school that, uh, you know, I sort of hanging around with different people. I got into like more, um, at, at that time, more modern rock bands. Your Def Leppard, your Bon Jovi, your Motley Crue, 80s hair bands, you know. Um, and, and that for me, that was it. That, that got me right into, into music. Um, and... Uh, from there on, uh, I just sort of fell into being in a band, really. It was at college, um, doing a sort of, uh, it was a corporate sort of law um, course I was doing. And I dropped out after three months because someone in the course said, do you want to be in a band? And I was like, I've never been in a band before. I'll go the singer. I'll go the singer. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and that was that. That was, that was me. Um, just sort of changed course, changed directions, and then, you know, singing in bands for years and years and years before before we've done this. Must be a thing that Ian, because people that have that are band managers. I had something similar. I wanted to be a drummer until somebody pointed out to me that they were at the back of the stage, and I thought, I fuck that. I'll be a singer then. <laughs> 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 so, if we talk about when you went, so obviously both of you. Well, Bobby, you're still in a band, and um, Jay, you've been singing bands. So, if you to go back and look at what singers in particular or which people, musicians, which bands was it that said, you know what, 
I'm going to do it. I'm going to, I want to be in a band. You know, was there any specific artists that you, you looked up to and went, that's who I, I want to be just like him or her? Bobby. Well, <laughs> it's an easy one for me. I'm like a broken record, but. Uh, Bass out of rollers, mate. Bass out of rollers. I've guessed. Uh, uh, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Rest in peace, Liz. But um, no, it was uh, obviously Metallica for me. Um, uh, I, I kind of got introduced to them about 94, 95, and um, just just in awe of them ever since, to be fair. So James Hetfield, for me, was always the, um, you know, it's one of these things that'll, that'll always bug me for the rest of my life, but I, I can't physically play the guitar and sing at the same time, so I could never be a fully a clone of James Hetfield, but I always liked his his voice and, and his singing style. Um and I kind of, I kind of uh, tried to create my own <clears throat> version of that. Tried to copy him a little bit when I was younger, and then found my own voice. So it's an easy one for me. Like I say, everybody gets sick of me talking about it, but yeah, that's that's my. Uh, he was my inspiration, to be fair. Cool. What about you, Jay? Um, probably. I, I mean, being in high school and then sort of going into the whole sort of like you no know, the. Uh, the hair rock stuff. Um, for me, <laughs> for me, my idol was was uh, was John Bon Jovi. You know, he was um, he, he he was my he was my god for about ten years. You know, anything they've done, probably seen Bon Jovi more than any other band live. That type of thing. You know, um, uh, so I think I think probably wanted to be in a band just because of that. You know, that was the type of covers we done as well um, when we started off. Um, and uh, you know, progressed and progressed into obviously different bands. But for me, you know, that that, that was that that was the main band for me. You know, uh, around all those other bands of that time, um, definitely Bon Jovi and John Bon Jovi were were my my go to guy. You know. So obviously, it was lads. <laughs> like, yeah, you picked two biggest names out there. Is there anyone else who you you think you know of? Uh, that, that they've got it, they've got it as well. Like you know what I mean? Because obviously you're both vocalists. So is there any yeah. any other any others? Because obviously there's got to be other 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 famous singers or other other singers that you thought they I want to be like them. Yeah. I, to be I, fair, I, I never really um, I never really got like um, I don't know. There was different types, different styles to see that even the type of music they'd be playing. Nocturne Wolf. It's heavy, but it's melodic. And um, okay. you know, I was never a big fan of the screaming and shouting and stuff. So it was it was difficult for me. I like Pantera. I like Phil Anselmo. Yeah. Uh, you know the stage presence and things like that. He was a you know a good front man. The, um, the thing about Phil though, he can actually sing. Yeah, yeah, but he's 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 he's, he's got that he's got that aggressive kind of style. Yeah. Um. Uh. Which which worked for that for the band, if you know what I mean. But um. I preferred more of a, a, a melody, you know, like I like uh, Rob Halford, for example. Yeah. Uh, you know, because of the range that he's got as well. You know, I try and I, I try and kind of emulate that in some of our songs as well. Um, What's in that? When I listen to Nocturne Wolf, Bob, I like I like you when you're more melodic mm -hmm. necessarily than I man, that might be just my taste as well, you know, but I like you're more melodic when you're singing proper what I would call proper singing rather than when you shout it all works don't get me wrong but my preference is I think you've actually got a really good melody you know a good melodious voice which I think is cool and I think that's what sometimes makes a difference with Nocturne Wolf because I remember once asking somebody to put you on a show and he couldn't get his head around it because he heard your voice and he heard the music and he just in his head couldn't put the two together but I was like well that's a good thing you know, surely to Christ, that's a good thing. They're not yeah. clones. You know, yeah. but you can and when it's live, when it's live, obviously when the adrenaline kicks in and you're on stage, um, and you can't hear anything, then uh, then the, yeah, it does get a little bit more growly and shouty. You know, um, yeah, I just blame the lads because they keep turning their cabs up all the time. You know, so <laughs> nothing wrong with that. I am not even taking that from a singer. I'm a guitarist. <laughs> never happens. We never touch our dials after the sound engineers. Not, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, no it's, it's the extra pedals you put in that are already set to louder. I don't know what you mean, mate. That's, uh, <laughs> so moving on. Right, let's talk about reaction management then. Where, when did it start and why? Um, 
I had uh, I'd done a lot of promotion after I'd sort of been in out of bands over for you know probably the last twenty years. So probably um, started promoting a lot of bands in Glasgow, uh, at the garage and the cat house and, and venues like that. Um, you know, ju just um, either 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 small touring bands or like trying to bring local bands. That, had Biffy Clyro, you know, used to promote Biffy Clyro when they were just uh, a wee, three wee Scottish boys playing in front of 20 people. You know, it's uh, mm -hmm. when you're talking to other bands, it's good to say that, you know, that Biffy Clyro were just like you guys, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and so I did a lot of promotion and stuff. And like most people in this game, um, if you're a good promoter and if you're an honest promoter, you don't make a lot of money half the time, you know. Um, so I was like... I don't know how many times I stopped doing it and then I would start doing it again because I think it's in your blood, you know, to go back to doing this kind of thing. Um, and one of the gigs I did was um, promoting a band, a Glasgow band called Altered Sky um, at the garage. It was a sellout. Um, and uh, I went up to them and I went, hey, you guys, you guys have something, you know, um, you should really look at getting a manager, blah, blah, blah. And they put me on the spot and said, well, why don't you do it? And I was like, it's not really my scene. Um, and he pressurized me for a few days, and I thought, right, okay, I'll do it. You know, I'll I'll, I'll do this. Um, and over the next five six years, I stopped promoting, and I just managed this one band, Altered Sky, um, who sadly aren't with us anymore, but they went really, really, really far. Um, and uh, to, to to sort of to make it more professional, I created a I created a management company, you know, reaction management. Um, so that everything was done properly, you know, and, and through this company. Um, and that's, uh, that's how the reaction started, you know, initially. And then over the last few years, when all the sky um, split up, I thought, okay, I've got a lot of time, <laughs> a lot of time and, and money yeah. into this band. Um, I've got nothing really to show for it. Let's, <laughs> um, let's do what I've done with all the sky and actually open this company up into a roster. And that's how we've now got, you know, Five years later, there's like twenty odd bands, you know, on the roster. That's cool. Cause so, I mean, the the thing I think you're the first management company we've actually <laughs> talked to, which is cool. So, could you talk us through? Because a lot of people will watch this, especially young bands, young musicians, and they don't really know what a manager does, or worse, they think they know, and it's not actually what a manager does. So could you talk, you two guys talk us through, like when you're working with the bands that you're particular with, because I know, Bobby, you look after a couple of bands. Jay, you've got some, you've got other agents that look after other bands. Can you talk us through how you, um, what it is that you do when you plan short term, medium term and longer term on behalf of the bands? Well, for, for me personally, it's... Um... Each band, each band is completely different um, in terms of the the role that you that you play for them. Some some of them want you to do different specific um, operations, and other ones basically want you to do different things. So you've kind of it's 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 kind of set up a niche for each individual band. So uh, with the divinators, for example, the um, I help them out with it with social media and stuff like that. Um, a ritual spirit, they, they don't need that, they look after it themselves. Um, so, because um, when I was in Nocturne Wolf, and when the, at the start, when we signed up with Reaction, uh, Jay had kind of talked us through the, the process of the, it was basically the, the timeline. Um, it was a six month timeline at the time, because everything was normal. Um, and it was basically, right, okay, this is what we're going to do in the next six months. Once we'd had a discussion about what music that we had um, written, what was recorded, what how we wanted to to uh, release the music, how we wanted to go, you know, what gigs we wanted to play, what uh, tours we wanted to play, things like that. Mm -hmm. So that was all that was all scheduled into a, like a six month timeline. So a plan was put in place right from the start, and then so that, that that's kind of what I do with my bands. Last year was obviously a. The, the two bands I've got actually came on during the pandemic. So that six month timeline was was completely different because the, the there was no gigs and there still isn't any gigs. So it was um it was a challenge, but it was it was good because it was a case of right, let's plan for virtual shows and concentrate on the you know the writing and how we're going to um, put a plan in place to get the to get the music released um, and with PR and things like that. So that's kind of 
it, it's, it's, it sounds basic from my end. Jay, Jay will do it completely different to me, but it's basically I, I go in, um, have a meeting, create a plan for six months, and then we'll try and stick to that as best as we can. Things change, obviously, but if you've got the plan to, you know, as your base, um, then, we, then we take it from there. So if a band's really interested in obviously getting management and stuff like that, what are the sorts of things that you look for in a band? What are, what 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 makes you go? You know what? I want to sign them. I want to add them to my roster. For for me personally, um, I need to connect with the music. I think uh, um, the, the band could look great. They could have great stats. They could have good social media figures, and and they, they could look the package. But unless I I'm, I'm into the music and. Um, I'm, the, the the roster now uh, is everything from like you know like Felix Saunders who's you know um, who's folk music right through to your your Nocturne Wolves and and your your Arc Arrivals and everything in between. So it's a broad genre. So um, uh, I really need to I need to I need to like the music. I need to enjoy it. I need to be walking away with a song still in my head or something um, for me to have a, a vested interest because I think. You're just going through the motions. Otherwise, like every band I take on, every band I manage, um, there's a little bit of me as a singer still in all these bands because I kind of still want, I want to have my success through their success. Does that make sense? Yeah, so, it makes perfect. So, so, so I'm like, so obviously I want, I want the best for them. So I'm going to work as hard for them. Sometimes harder, which is when you notice some bands are not pulling their weight, and that's the first thing I'll say to any band is that I will work. It's hard for you, but you have to work as hard back. You don't just get a manager and go, right, manager's doing everything now. Do you know? Um, it, it doesn't work that way. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's a partnership, I think. But for me, the very first thing is you have to you have to like the music. You know, wow. otherwise, yeah. otherwise we could have 100 bands on the roster just now. You know? I agree. I couldn't, I couldn't agree with you more, mate, because it's murder. Because the other thing is as well that I'll get people will send me this, they'll say, oh, they're this or that, you need to listen to this band, you need to listen to that band. And then I sit the same with the music, and the worst thing is, for me, the music starts and I'm going, that's great, that sounds amazing. But there's three years here that are singers, and then when the singer's voice comes in, you're like, oh, oh, oh. Yeah. no, no, no. <laughs> Why did you ruin it by opening your gift? You know, and, and I can't yeah. get away from that. If, if I don't like the voice, that's me, game's a bogey. Yeah. You know, and I'll be honest with bands and I'll say that. But, you know, it's quite interesting because I, I have a fairly wide, um, our, our roster's quite wide in genres, but not hugely so. Um, what do you do, Jay, when you get the when you get somebody sending something through to you? And Bobby as well, but Jay in particular with this one. When you get something sent to you and you, you're thinking, have you even bothered looking at it? You know, like I get hip-hop guys sending me stuff. You know, and I, well, Bobby's, Bobby's laughing because I got an email a couple of days ago and it was the most pretentious email. Normally, people that send themselves up straight away, I go, this this is going to be spectacularly bad, right? So this guy was, this guy thought he was the dog's bollocks and he was talking about how um, I, I had to sign him and um, I was to reply promptly with a... Um, you know, with with a plan for him and whatnot, and he wouldn't, he wouldn't, think he was, and as a sort of footnote, he was, he was talking to other management companies too, as if I was going to panic. And he sent a link, and I, I can't, e I can't even describe it. Um, it was, fish. It, it was, it, well, I, yeah, I like it was Scottish rapper. Uh, <laughs> it, it sounded like everything was done on like a Casio. A Casio keyboard player with the drums and everything, and then with him singing very weirdly over it, and yet in his head, see, see when you watch these, like I don't watch them anymore, but when you see these clips of like X Factor and all these things, and you go, these people are deluded, and you think, nah, it's just all showbiz. I think there are people out there who, in their head, or they've been told throughout their life, ah, that's great, that's great, keep doing what you're doing, and then, then, then we get emails like the ones obviously I shared with, with Bobby. A couple of days ago, and you're going, wow, you know, just wow. <laughs> you know, do you know what, mate? You you shared one in social media, Jay, and it's the best thing I have ever seen in music. And it was the guy. It was a guy. I think he messaged you or emailed you or something, and he basically said you had to sign him because he'd written the new 
Uh, I think it was the new Scottish national anthem or something. That's right. and I, I, I was crying. I read it and I was literally buckled. I was crying. It was oh. the best thing ever. I, I did. I did apologise to Jay though. I did apologise. <laughs> just sign him. Just sign him. He's got. He's got just um, just for the hell of it. See where this goes. But um, it was. Uh, I think I replied to him, and he replied back saying something like. Oh, I didn't even think you replied. I was pissed when I wrote this. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, find, I find it, I'm duty bound. I, I write back to everybody. I fucking set myself right up now. But even people with give my radio show, they send stuff in and I go, nah, it's, it doesn't fit in or it's not quite enough. I, but I feel that I need to tell people. And then when you get them going, yeah, but I, I think it does fit in. No, it doesn't, mate. Yeah, I, well, I've listened to the show and I think it does. All right then, you're just not good enough. All right, <laughs> so, because there are, <laughs> there are a lot of deluded people out there. I mean, joking aside, it is a bloody nightmare. And it's it, here's where I'm going. To, I did say I'd go off piece with this, but this is another one, guys. That I think it's like when you've got musicians, you got bands, and they want you to manage them, and then they ask you what you really think about them, and you and you tell them, and you're trying to back bend them and shape them, but they just don't want to listen. What do you do in a situation like that? Personally, I think Jay would have more experience with that one. Too. Uh, I uh, I have what I call a honeymoon period with bands. So you know what the, the bands come in, um, and we have our timeline chat and we discuss um, uh, where I think that the, the the band would go. Um, you know, places we can play, things we can do to build up the brand. Uh, I'm very boring when it comes to stuff like that. I keep talking about bands as brands and and building them that way. And it's a nice honeymoon period. And then a few months down the line, that's when you're like, no, you're not pulling your weight. I think this is shit. You know, you suddenly develop, you get to know the band a bit better and they know you better and you can be a bit more honest with them, um, which I think you have to be anyway. There's no point telling a band constantly, that's great. You know, yeah, but they, 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 you, know they, you let them hear a demo and you go, that's great. When you think, no, I, I don't think that's good. I think that's the only way. Um, moving forward, and I've told loads of bands that in the past, I don't think that's good enough, you know, let's do this, let's do that instead. Um, I'm not always right, you know, but that, that's, every day's, a, every day's still a school day when you're when you're managing, you know, you know yourselves, but um, eh, I think, um, yeah, uh, you have to be brutally honest sometimes with bands and, you know, even bands that you've worked with for years, you know. Well, yeah, I mean, it's like I've got one, I've got one band, and he won't send me anything before eight o'clock in the morning because he says I'm more brutal before eight o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> more brutally honest. I says, "Well, you fucking, you know, I've only had two coffees by that time, mate." <laughs> but, it, but you know, yeah, I think it's, I think it's. I mean, Ian, I've, I've done it with you, mate, haven't I? You've sent yeah. me some stuff through in a mix or something. I'm going, you know, did you mix that with a Kenwood Chef? That sounds terrible, can you style. <laughs> it's just not right, you know. I mean, the thing is, and it, it sounds it sounds brutal, but I don't want my mum to tell me that it sounds fucking great. Love me mum, but sorry, she ain't got a clue about music. Neither of your family members, neither of anything. If people who like yourselves who are just gonna say, Yeah, it's okay, or can you do this and it'll sound better? And I'd, that's the sort of feedback that I'd want. I'd like, you know what I mean? That's why you send it out to people before it goes out anywhere on, on any radio or anything. Let us know what you think of this. Is this all right? Um, I've, I've had loads of feedback and, and some of it is pretty brutal, but it's it comes down to the, the other thing as well. It's like me sending, I don't know, like I don't take this the wrong way, but it's like me sending Bon Jovi to Bobby and saying, what do you think of that when he's big into Hetfield? And, like, you know, he, he's just going to go, not my kind of cup of tea, but you can still do something with it. And that's the thing. It's like, you know, it's down to what... It's using the common sense. Find people who are in that genre, I find, who's going to give you an honest answer. They're either going to say, yeah, do this, do that. If they say it's great, don't, don't change it, then I'd actually say go and find someone else to find fault. Because there's always a way of making it better, and mm. it sounds it sounds shit, but it's true. There's always someone out there who's going to say, "Put more fills in, take less is more, do the usual stuff." Like you know what I mean? And it, it's one of them where get a mixed variety of people who you can you can actually like you know get some decent feedback from. Mm. And, if, and if, then you're you, a, if you're a musician and you're watching this and you don't have management and you don't fancy the sound of that, then don't get management. 
Because if you get a manager that doesn't want to do that, then there's something wrong with them, I would say. How, how many bands out there, even with or without management, have, you know, sat in the recording studio, have heard the final mix, and everyone's looked at each other, and the engineer, the producers, went, so is that good? We okay, is that good? And everyone just looks at each other and shakes their head and goes, yeah, that's fine. They go home and they play. They're all excited to play it, and everyone finds faults with it because they didn't speak up at the time. It's the same sort of principle. You know? mm. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. Do you know, we've all been there. We've all been there. Yeah, that is a very valid point. And, like, and, it, and it, ruins, it ruins your the song forever. I, I get tracks I listened to that I recorded 10, 15 years ago. Um, an album I recorded where I'll only listen to maybe four songs on it because the other six, I know I'm waiting for the, the horrible bits in it that I don't like anymore, you know? And, 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 that's, a, that's great advice to anyone who's listening, is never accept the first mix. Always take it on. Go and play it on your car radio. Go and play it on your crappy, cheap cheap stereo. Go and play it on a walk and play it on any... any, play, on any phone, car. play it anywhere. Yeah. Play, play it on a mono, play it on stereo, play it on everything, and then then you can hear the, the, the horrible bits, the high pitching that you can't hear in certain things because the, there's noise reduction on your car stereo and stuff like that. It's a, it's a valid point, Jay. Very valid yeah. point, mate. And, and, it, and, it is, and it is our job. It is our job <coughs> to work with any band that we manage to try and get them to produce. Not tell them what to do, but give them the very best chance, I think, of, of achieving whatever it is they feel that they, they should be achieving or we feel together we can achieve. And, and it is as simple as that. So, guys, quick question. Obviously, COVID bitten us all on the arse. And it, it's like good to see that you guys have been quite busy. Can you tell us about the Scottish uh, the scene in Scotland? What's it like? What was it like post-COVID? Uh, yeah, pre-COVID and po what's going to be like? What are you going to see changes in uh, post-COVID, when we're all allowed out and playing. Um, Bobby, you, you take this just now as a sort of, <coughs> you know, as an artist as well. Yeah, um, pre-COVID it was, um, the, the Scottish team's uh, really strong, especially in, in the, you know, more specifically in, in the metal genre that, that, that I'm in. Um, in Glasgow alone, uh, I shouldn't single out Glasgow, I mean, there's, there's, there's loads of good bands across the country, but you know, before before COVID struck, there was there was a, a really healthy metal scene in, in Glasgow, and it was there was a lot of good bands. Um, hopefully, there still is by the time we come back out of it. But um, yeah, obviously, it just when everything came crashing down, it was a bit like well, um, a lot of bands have went quiet. Um, a lot of bands have used the time as a good opportunity to write new material and crack on. Um, some I, I think I found that that some guys are just all they do, all they want to do is play gigs, and if the gigs aren't there, then the the kind of the passion's gone from the music. Um, so it's been a tough time to be fair for for a, for a lot of guys, but you can see everything. <laughs> everybody's starting to kind of wake up now, and and things are happening again. Uh, gigs are getting announced, and and um, everything's getting planned again. Um, touch wood. Uh, we've got a reaction uh, kind of gig hopefully at some point in the future sure okay. um, so yeah we just I think I think it's a case of we just want to uh, we want to get back out there again but we don't really know what the, the landscape's going to look like um, um, you know and it kind of it's a bit intimidating for, for a lot of people you know so I mean I, but, you said Bobby there about it being like really strong the metal scene in Glasgow. So, can you can, can you explain that a bit better? Because to me, strong is you're playing gigs and it's near enough max capacity crowds every time, and the bands are getting some money out of it, and there's plenty of shows. Was it that good? I would no. I'll define it in, properly. Then it's it. It was strong to me in terms of the quality of the of the bands. Hmm. That's what I mean. It's. I, <laughs> I've said it a couple of times on another couple of podcasts that, um, you know, it's not the first time I've played in front of three people in Edinburgh at Bannermans or 12 people at Ivory Blacks in Glasgow. Um, and I just, I've said, I've said it like, you know, when, when things do come back and, and, and things are full capacity again, 
the fact that people have been starved of live music for so long, um, I just hope they don't go back to that that way. Do you know, like um, in terms of, you know, you've not had music for 18 months or two years. So go back, get out there and go and actually get off your arse and go and see the shows. Um, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to come across as as too uh, too harsh on the punters, but it was get it was getting to that point where, you know, you, one week you could play a show in front of three hundred, and the next week you could play in front of three. Um, so yeah, I, ho I hope it doesn't go back to that. I think the fact that the you know the international bands and the bigger bands and you know their your hydros and ACCC gigs and that they probably won't be back. It, it's a perfect opportunity for the grassroots. Um, seen you know the grassroots bands um, to bring in more people to their shows. I think you so, know what yeah. you've just you've just nailed something on the head there. I think obviously with all the borders closed and stuff like that, I think it's a great opportunity. My only concern is that we've got the venues to play in because a lot of venues have had to close due down to this, and that is real. It is a major real concern for me. I think like, you know, like I've played Bannermans and it was booming. I love it up there. I love the atmosphere. I'd love to play Glasgow, but I'd, it's one of them where I'm, I'm like, how many venues are still open? What venues are there? Like, and I think that's the biggest challenge. Like, you know, what venue, what venues? And as long as they don't outprice the punters, because they haven't been, they're trying to make the money back. Um, I think um, most of the most of the Glasgow venues are still still kicking. To be honest with you, yeah. I'm trying to think off the top of my head what what's not, but majority are still there. Uh, yeah. And they're still they're, they're they're actively planning like you know, uh, jail with jail. Know this, you all know this. But I'm, I mean, I'm trying to book gigs at the moment, and it's uh, just constantly no, nah, no, nah, that date's not available. That's not available because every 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 weekend's booked up. So, um, and in terms of the pricing, that I, I had a I had a a conversation with, with one of my bands about this, and two guys from the same band had a completely different outlook on it. You know, it's like, how much should we charge for this night? And one guy said, let's charge a fiver and get as many people as possible. And the other guy said, well, that's too cheap. Let's charge a tenner. Um, so it's kind of like pick a number out of the sky and then we'll we'll see, you know, how much is it how much is it worth, basically? Because my my argument was if Metallica come to Manchester, then I'm paying 500 quid. It doesn't bother me. So if, if I can pay for 500 for one night, I'm not going to argue of over a fiver for going to see four bands, you know. But Jay, do you, you mean you've obviously been doing it a lot longer, purely in the management side. So, what was your thoughts on the on the on the scene as a whole, beyond metal as well? And Scott, oh, yeah, um, like I said, I sort of branched out and started bringing in, you know, indie rock bands, alt bands, folk bands. Um, we've even got a a Glaswegian hip hop band on the roster. Um, a that in itself shows you, you know, how vibrant the Scottish scene is, I think. You know, there's so much out there, so much good talent across uh, all the genres. Um, Pre-COVID, um, it, it was, a, it was a, kicking, a kick in the balls for a lot of bands on the roster because a lot of them had been building up and following a timeline for like six, nine months, a year. And we got to pinnacle points where um, we had big supports lined up um, we had uh, like main stages of the garages for some show tours. Um, one band in particular, we're going to be doing um, an HEMV Glasgow in store, a full electric store. The last band to do that was Biffy Clyro. So things were looking really, really good. And then within a couple of weeks, obviously, you know, uh, you know, everything went tits up for everybody. So um, I think, and obviously, as I said right at the start. For me, it was a case of right bands, try and keep relevant, get some get some stuff out there. Um, some bands, and even some bands I know that aren't on the roster, just sort of took, they never took a year off, but you know, mental health played a massive part to a lot of things as well. You know, a lot of bands, a lot of bands, their only release was going to was either playing gigs or even just going to the rehearsal studio once or twice a week, you know, um, letting off steam. Um, and not even being able to do that, I think, affected a lot of bands. Um, but uh, as a manager as well, you, you've got to always be like a father figure, and that's kind of what I was like over the last year. You've got to 
and you know you, you put your arm around certain members and you know and, and sort of encourage them and tell them this is going to be okay this is going to be all right um um and they i mean my phone's on constantly so sometimes i'll be answering messages from band members you know midnight and onwards because i i don't like to leave people hanging um uh obviously um like a couple you know a year or so ago year and a half ago like was a band called the remains and the guitarist from that band you know um, committed suicide for, for so many different reasons so things like that play in your mind a lot you know and my thought was this is going to be really hard during a lockdown you know um for for creative people especially for everybody but for, for, for my line of work it was creative people so we're just keeping everybody doing something with a project with whether that's releasing music and almost perversely coming out of this now i think the bands that have continued to do stuff um release music um are now in a better place because over the last year the amount of um band members i know that have learned videography have learned sound production have learned graphic design have learned stuff that they can now do for their own band instead of having to pay someone else to do it it's it staggering you know so i think all the people of went, do you know what I'm going to use this year to benefit me and benefit the band, um, are now going to come out of this with everything still intact. They've got new talents that they've worked on. And hey, they've got gigs at the end of this too, mm. you know? I agree. Now, just to carry on with the Scotland theme, because obviously, I mean, I'm obviously Scottish, but I've been down here for 30 years. So the scene, I don't know the scene in Scotland very well at all. Is there anything specifically that you think is peculiar to the Scottish scene when it comes to, let's use the word breaking out of Scotland into the rest of the U, just like even into the rest of the UK, down into England and Wales? You know, do you find that you're coming up against specific problems that you think is peculiar to being to geographic reasons? Mm, I, um, I'll quickly then I'll let Bobby jump on. I've always found a problem getting bands on festivals more than anything i mean you can you can book a tour um obviously it doesn't matter if a band's you know 10 miles away from like say southampton or 400 four five hundred miles away you generally are all on the same kind of guarantee that's just the way mm. that's the way it works but uh um i've always had a problem getting um getting bands on uh, festivals, rock festivals. I, I don't know. They, they always seem to be very, very um, dominated by you know by by the local bands or by by English bands in particular. Maybe that's because they they, they have to they go right. Well, we need to sell tickets here, so it's uh, it, it makes more sense to have bands of our own um, from our own country here. But then you look at then you look at a lot of Scottish festivals and a lot of English bands are always up there too. So I don't know. But that's always been a bugbear of mine. But I don't know about Bobby. No, I would agree, to be fair. I think it's, obviously, you've got 10 times the amount of competition uh, in England. Um, you know, and I've, I've not pl played many shows with Nocturne Wheel for England, but, uh, you know, it's, it's it's just human nature. If, if if you're not really in their faces, you know, in, in terms of being well-known, then, then it's tough to attract numbers to, to come to the shows. Um, I think collaboration you know that's something I look into is, is you know finding bands down south that you could get gig swap with and share with you know um, and get you know because for some reason we can we can we can get English uh, bands up here no problem um, and then hope it hopefully it's reciprocated for us to go to go down south you know so I think it's all about I don't know there seems to be some sort of block there and I don't really understand it but me personally, you know, I, I just think that um, it's some, it's just a, it's just a stumbling block that would be in your way. That, that there's always a way around it. I think it's just you've kind of got to find a solution and try to find out the right people to speak to, you know, and and, and form um, relationships and friendships with guys down south. I think that's the only way forward. To be fair, yeah, you've got to find your market as well and find out where, um, you know. Uh, what cities are listening to your band, you know, so, you know, follow up all your demographics and um, who, who's playing your music, what local radio stations have been playing your music, um, which is why, which is why when I'm, when I managed Alter Sky, we decided, right, hang on, I'm only here like a seven day tour of the UK 
it's costing you guys fifteen hundred pound, two thousand pound, you know, with your travel lodges and your van hire and your this and your that. Um and, and any band that does that and breaks even is doing very well. <laughs> you know, you break even on a tour like that. So we noticed um they were getting a lot of um a lot of attention in like in, in Japan and the Philippines, you know, a lot of plays and we thought, right, I, I wonder if we could you could go over to the Philippines or, or Japan and play. Um so we'd have to be booked like a, a 20 day tour of the Philippines, um, took them to Japan as well for a week, took them to Tokyo. And it cost it cost like fifteen hundred pounds more than a UK 10 day tour. And they were playing to a lot more fans. And you know, and that's something that's going to live with them forever. And I I, I couldn't get over how something so far away, bigger shows, better shows, loads and loads of fans could cost the same, you know. That's a great little story, that Jay. Um, what like because I've always been intrigued about playing Europe and stuff like that. And I know with the Brexit thing, it's screwed up everything with visas and stuff, and it's it's turned into a mess. Obviously, like you know, you're on about playing the Philippines and Tokyo. What, what was the visas situation with that? And <laughs> or don't yeah. ask, no, none at all. We we I found um. And we were trying to do everything meticulously, all the planning. Um, and when we asked the promoters at the time and the bookers we were working with in Tokyo and, um, and, and Manila, um, they were like, no, nah, it's okay, they won't ask you. Um, and, and obviously you're getting little doubts in your head going, this is going to go tits up somewhere. You know, um, I'm going to have a band that's not going to get in or I'm going to have a band that's not going to get back <laughs> out of the country. Um, and not at one point, even in Japan or Tokyo, where you would think that would be meticulous, was any of them asked for visas. And these guys were walking, picking up their guitars from the, you know, the travelers and all that. So they were they were one hundred percent musicians touring, you know, um, and no one asked for visas at all. Okay, that's quite cool. That's an interesting story, though. Yeah. So obviously, let the, we're on about like new bands helping out new bands, as as John put at the start of it. Um, if if a new if you could give advice to a new band, right at the start of their career, what would you advise them to make it the most successful start so they're, they're on the right foot when right from the beginning? Who wants to go, me or you? <laughs> you go first, Bobby. <laughs> <laughs> Don't drink. Um... <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I must admit the. Uh, yeah, hindsight's wonderful. If you could go back in time, it'd be brilliant. Um, yeah. No, to be fair, it's it's just kind of like it's it's having the right attitude and the and the right. It's treating it like a profession. I think I know music's all about fun and and you know it, it's something that you're passionate about and that you love. But if you go into to being in a band, it's basically like treat it like like a profession, like you would do with any with any job in life. Um, do everything to the Everything that you do, basically, that you approach with that band, do it to the highest possible capability that you can that you can do. So if you're, you know, if you're going to record, um, you know, you've got some songs together and you and and you're happy with them and you want to go and record, then go and find the best way to record them with the money you've got available. Um, go and speak to other bands that have got some experience and and you know gigging and and recording things like that and get take as much as advice as you can. Um, listen to everybody. You know, you you might get varying um, advice from people, and you might get you know you might get good and bad, but you, you should definitely go and speak to as many people as possible that are involved in the same the same industry. Go to as many gigs as you can, and always make sure if you're playing a gig, um, don't disappear after you've played your set. You know, start, hang around and watch all the other bands as well. Just just common courtesy, and and it's just a professional um, kind of way to look at it. That's that's. Well, I would say to any kind of young bands that are starting out. That's a good shout. You know, never burn your bridges. You know, never burn any bridges because um, you might think you're on the way up, but you might need these people when you're going on the way down again. You know, I've always, I've always said that. Um, but I think the I read somewhere a few years ago, and it was something that always stuck with me. And it was, um, don't expect. Um, a, I go actually written it down here. What was it? Um, yeah, don't expect career level results if all you're going to offer is like hobby level commitment. 
you know. Yeah. Um, and that, that for me, when you say that to a band, something clicks. I, I, I think because um every band knows they have certain members in the band as well who, who probably don't pull the weight they should do, do, you know. Um and I've always said like um uh, like say, say one person in a band is that super productive guy who who's on top of everything. He's he's the one that's dealing with the management. And, you know, if you had five of them in a band, you wouldn't even need the manager. Do you know if you had five of those people in that band? Um, but the first thing I say to every band right at the very start is, do you actually need a manager? Are you just looking for somebody to to sort of wear a magic wand and go right? This is all going to happen while you sort of write songs in the studio. Um, and you wouldn't believe the amount of people that go, oh, actually, right enough, but we're, we're not at that stage yet, you know? I think the other thing is as well that, you know, some of the bands that I know, uh, musicians that I know, are amazing. Like, one of my favourites is, is Twisted Illusion. Matt, we interviewed them, or I interviewed them, actually. And he's so talented. But I would never even approach that guy about come and work with me, because you know why? A, he's unmanageable because he's so damn good at it himself. So not every band needs help from people like us, but neither should we be a stick and plaster. We shouldn't be the thing where it's one guy does everything in the band because either he's a control freak or nobody else cares other than playing the musician, uh, playing the music, and they don't want to because the truth of the matter is that's when it goes tits up because if there's if there's four or five of you in a band or three in a band, then split the jobs in between you right at the early stages. If one of you is better at social media, do the social media, but do it bloody well. If one of you is better at the operational side and booking gigs, then do it. But do it right for the start. And no matter if you're the biggest control freak in the world and you think you can do everything better than everybody else in the band, you still can't, it won't work because you'll burn yourself out. And what will happen is you'll find yourself jacking it in and it'll be everybody else's fault except yours. Everyone can do something in a band. Even if it's booking rehearsals, it takes that little bit of pressure away from the rest of the band who are doing other bits. And if you don't think you can do those things, then, like you say, maybe it's not the right profession for you guys. Like you say, if you just want <clears> to <throat> go to... A, it, sounds, it sounds a bit harsh, but you've got to make decisions within bands and as I say, they're, they're not always nice decisions. But like you say, you, if they weren't pulling the weight in, in a normal nine to five job or whatever job you do, you wouldn't be allowed to fucking continue. You'd be fucking fired. They'd kick your yeah. ass out the door. And that's the way it should be within a band. If you get five people in a band and two of them are really pulling their weight and the other three aren't, you're actually going backwards, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we, we've Ian and I's interviewed people that are at a level of music we've never been at. Like we, we interviewed Ricky Warwick. Ricky Warwick, I think it was said, for every hour he does, he does six or seven days a week, six or seven hours a day, and that's Ricky Warwick because he feels that it's his job, and that's what he says. His father was a farmer, and his father worked fourteen hour shift, fourteen hour days, seven days a week. He says, so I just took that work ethic and made it into music because that's my business. And that's a brilliant way to look at it. And, it, yeah. and I mean, it's, I think somebody else said that, I can't remember who it was, Ian, but somebody said, for every hour of music that you do, you need to do eight or nine hours of the business side of things if you want to succeed. Hmm. You know, and that's, and that's what it is. So let's move to the last question, guys. I'd like your views on how bands can make the most of the various income streams nowadays, you know? Everybody knows you, you can't make money or selling albums as much, and et cetera, et cetera. So what, what do you suggest to, you, to these young bands that may be watching this as a good way of making some money outside the obvious as well as the obvious? Um, <laughs> I uh, obviously, as you mentioned, streaming, unless you're a major, major band, and even a lot of major bands aren't making a lot of money from, uh, from, from streaming sites. But... Uh, I, I'm, I'm still old school. I think if you're going to be touring, if you're going to be playing, when that all kicks back in, um, it's all about merch for me, you know. Um, selling merch and selling it wisely, not not wasting a lot of money on a lot of product, just buying enough product, selling that product, then buying a little bit more product and just building yourself up that way. Um, yeah. 
one thing I tell bands all the time, especially bands that are able to go out there and busk, is you would not believe the amount of money you can make. You can make busking. Do you know, um, um, I've had artists in the in the past who went out, um, maybe it's a two piece or a three piece, and made three four hundred pound a day. That's the kind of money that can finance a band's full timeline. You know, if you're making that kind of money, um, it's all about the effort as well. You know, some bands will go. Oh, you will sigh and go, but then I need to carry my gear there and I need to do this. And it's like, well, where's the commitment? Do you know, um, there's people willingly there to, to give you guys money or for you just playing your songs and getting tighter as well. Um, other than that, you know, it's just about trying to uh, trying to get good guarantees as well. Um, even though there were no live music events over the last year, I think Reaction managed to pull on about maybe three thousand pounds from online fest, which just went straight to the straight to the bands, no middleman. Um so the money comes straight into us and we just divide it and we pay it out to the bands the bands that played them. So it's it's trying to uh trying to get the most you can as well for these bands as well, I think. <laughs> We, I've got, we've worked with a couple of bands and what they've actually got is they've got the band and the band name that they, we know them as, but they also go out some weekends when they don't have their own gigs under a different name playing covers and they're getting yep. four or 500, 600 quid for doing covers and they use that to augment the 100 quid they're getting for doing original. I mean, it's a crazy world we live in where that is. is. <laughs> but, and it's all ass about face, but the reality of it is those two bands have paid for al- have paid for al- like an album's worth of recording off the back yeah. of doing that, you know. And and I think and I think the thing you mentioned about merchandise, one of the things that I've noticed changed hugely um, during the lockdown in the last year because people suddenly realised they wanted to support bands was pre-sales. So pre-selling merchandise. So make it a small run. Say we're only having it available for this month. You know, if you order for the 1st to the 31st, then after that, you can't order it again. So people are paying up front, knowing they're not going to get it for six, eight weeks later. But the thing is, you're getting your money beforehand and you're also able to, you know, make, you know, you've got the profit before you put, you, you've got the money in before you pay anything out. So it takes away the guesswork. Mm-hmm. So the, I think that's something that's changed hugely in the last year that people said a Kickstarter is that if you're giving them something, they'll invest that money. And if you say, I want to use this to record the next EP or for PR for an EP, people who really like your music will quite happily put 15 quid towards a T-shirt and you're making a tenner on every one. You know, it's a, it's a different way of doing it, but I think it's it definitely works and I've had a few bands do it and worked really well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'd say so. That's what we do. That's what we do at Nocturne Wolf, to be fair. It's all about the... We've just got new T-shirts recently, and it's just um, we were lucky, lucky even during the lockdown without any gigs. We've we sold them out, and then and we've just received another batch from the money, obviously that we we took in from from the first batch. And um, I think you can definitely see the opportunity there for when the when the live gigs come back. If you've got, um, I've I've looked at you know, I'm kind of, I'm still learning as well, you know. And it's like you you look at some other bands, and they when they turn up at a live venue. They've got their merch uh, sorted out really well, you know, and you, you mm. look at them and you go, oh, that's a, that looks really professional, to be fair. And then you can take the little bits off of off, off the other bands as well. Um, and before you know it, you've got you've got four or five different products to sell. Um, it's all about presentation as well. We, we, ah, absolutely. Things and, and, um, uh, and it's the little things too. Some of the bands that, you know, when, we, when, the, when they were touring, I would be like, have you got a card reader? He was like, no, we don't have a card reader. I was like, Gates has a card reader. He says, you wouldn't believe the amount of lost revenue you'll get at a gig because someone doesn't have any money on them. But someone's had a few drinks and have just watched your band. They'll just happily hand over your card and buy merch without, yeah. without a second thought. And then once these bands get a card reader, they're like, my God, we made 300 pounds more at that gig than we normally did. You know, so sometimes it's just the little things as well. I mean, you, yeah. you, you mentioned earlier about getting onto festivals, et cetera, and it being difficult to get into festivals. It's difficult for some English bands to get up into Scotland and Scottish bands to get... But one of the things that we... I can't remember, there's two or three... We've talked to quite a few people that run festivals. And interestingly, some of the things that they look for when they go to a gig to watch a band that they're consider, they're, they've been told to watch because they're thinking about putting them on a festival, the, th- the things like that where they see them turning up and they've got merchandise... 
They've actually got it laid out well. They've got a card reader. The fact that they talk nice to the people that's doing the sound for them, you know, they, they hang about, you know, that all, and that, you know, for a young band that's new, that's watching this, that's the kind of things that they're looking for. They're not just there to listen to your music because the other thing is they're also looking at you on a tiny little stage the size of a fireplace and wondering if you can make that bigger on a big stage. Does mm. your, can they imagine that? Take the imagination away, make it bloody obvious that you're slick at what you do and it'll go mm. a long way. One of, the, yeah. one of the best ones I actually heard, uh, and it sounds daft, like, you know what I mean? Because I thought I thought it was second nature to, to be polite and courteous and stuff like that. But one of the interesting ones was you've got a 30-minute time slot. How do you conduct yourself? Do you get on the stage? Do you put all your stuff on? Do you help other bands with their stuff off? Do you stick to your 30 minutes? Do you move all your stuff off quickly? Or do you actually stay on stage, be a dick, and then, like, you know, eat into the other band's time? And it's all the little things, like, you know what I mean? Oh, you've overrun by five minutes. Well, you've been told you've got 30 minutes. Make sure you snap to that 30 minutes. Yeah. And it's things like that where you just think, oh, yeah, never never actually seen it that way. Uh, blood, like, bloodstock, uh, you know, the bloodstock do the metal to the masses. And when we were in it, um, that's every round was like that. The, the first round, they would give you 15 minutes um, to, to get set up. And then the next round, they give you 10. Then it was seven and a half. The next round after that, and it was just to see how the band members interacted. And obviously, being a singer, I had like, I had like a nosebleed because I had to go and help out with, you know, actually carrying stuff, you know. And uh, it was a bit like, I don't, just, I don't like that. I don't like this, you know. But <laughs> just, just to put it into context, everyone, these three are singers. They've never <laughs> broken nail picking up a drum kit, guitar, amp, or anything. But those microphone stands were a ton. Just want to throw it out there. Yeah, dangerous. <laughs> and if you don't pick them up correctly, you can pull a muscle in your back. See, that's what, what I that, that's, <laughs> that's where you're wrong. Because when I when I sang in bands, we used to have to take a PA and everything with us. Because you never went to a venue that had a PA. We would to take mixing desks. I would have to hump the bloody lot. People used to say, "Well, did you join? Did you become a singer for the girls?" I was like, "By the time we got there, set up, get everything back down, and we were too knackered to go and do anything." <laughs> Good old days, my ass. <laughs> 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 oh, well, guys, that's cool. So there you have it. Thanks. I just want to say massive thanks, Jay. Thanks, Bobby. Thanks for yeah. having us on. Like, you know what I mean? Thanks for putting us on, like, you know, and getting involved in, in the show. But being a scouser, I've always got to be cheeky. I've always got to ask for more. So can you do us a favour? Can you give us all your links to your show? Like, how, how do we get in touch? Say a band wants to go, I want to get in touch with these guys and send them my CD, even if it is the new national anthem of Scotland. How do we get in touch with you guys? Um, the uh, the main hub then would be reactionmanagement.com. You know, www.reactionmanagement.com. Um, once, you, uh, once you're on that page, there'll be a link to all the artists there. You can check what bands are doing. There's a social media bit where you can see, you know, right, you know, in, in real time, everything that's happening with these bands. Um, and then you can you can you can uh, check the bands out and see what managers are managing the bands. And if it's the type of band that you think you are, you know there's a there's a link to an email address on that band. So like if you if you check you know Nocturne Wolf um, and, and you're a heavy metal band and you think right, I kind of like what's happening there, you you hit them. Um, my email address will come up. So it's all there. We're on all the socials, you know, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. We're very very busy. Um, uh, I'm constantly uh, pushing pushing the socials out there all day long as well. So um, it's a very, very busy social media group too. What I'll do for you, Jay, is I'll put all the links down below. So guys, click on the links down below. Check out all the bands. Check out the rosters. If you think you've got what it takes, get in touch with Reaction Management. The lovely guys. Nice guys. Get quite open. They'll honest and they'll tell you, they'll give you the honest feedback as well, um, which is what we all need in the music industry. Top blokes. So, guys, thank you very much for your time. There's only one, pleasure, more one more thing to say. John, over to you, mate. Uh, there's one last bit. If there's anybody watching us that wants to be a band manager, there's one thing I would say. When you've got a very Boy. busy, <laughs> when you've got a very busy, busy social media presence, it's a bad idea to give certain bands control of certain mediums. <laughs> <laughs> Is yeah, that right, Jay? Certain Rangers supporting bands, yes. Oh, well, you're <laughs> yes. Uh, I still, I still, 
I still get sponsored ads for between the royal family, uh, Stephen Tina Jenner, Turner. And all that. Constant Tina Turner, constantly <laughs> on my Facebook. You know. <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. Bobby, what Bobby told me that he was they were getting control of it one day. I think it was when you were down here, was it, Bobby? When, That's yeah, right, aye. He told me about it and he says, just watch it, mate. And I was like, oh, I was killed myself. Was <laughs> just priceless that way. So anyway, that is a good tip. Do not do that. <laughs> anyway, until the next time, ladies and gentlemen, and it's Scouse on the Scott, you know what to do. Hit that cowbell. Subscribe. <laughs>